My name is David Harris. I'm the managing director of the Charles Hamilton Institute Institute for Race and Justice. On behalf of Dean Martha Minow, I want to welcome you all to the law school today for a very special occasion. Uh, it, it, it's special in a, in a number of ways, uh, partially obviously the content, but for us uh, it has to do with the kinds of partnerships that went into uh, making this happen. So uh, I always like to try to thank and acknowledge people. And I have a long list today of people I think uh, I need to acknowledge. I need to start with uh, Kaya Stern, uh, who is somewhere bashing. Right. Okay. Uh, and Lauren Herman, uh, the two of whom really did uh, all of the work for this event. And Kaya had the original connection and uh, was really the driving force. And uh, we all go meet her later. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Kelly Garvin and Ernest Owens from our staff, who uh, always do incredible amounts of work behind the scenes and make all of our events go smoothly and work good. So Kelly, thank you. Ernest isn't here. <coughs> uh, I also owe a special thanks to Vera Grant at the Cooper Museum from the Hutchins Center, uh, who uh, had, I had a good sense to contact to see about having somebody help hang the show. And we were extremely fortunate to have uh, acquired the services of two very professional women, one of whom is here, uh, Namonu uh, uh, James, uh, back here, uh, and Taylor Aldrich, who uh, spent a lot of time hanging the show upstairs uh, with uh, attention and care. And you'll see the results when you go up. <coughs> Finally, <clears throat> I'd like to thank the co-sponsors. And again, I think for us at the Houston Institute, it's, it's really important for us to be able to engage uh, a number of different people from inside and outside the university, which we were able to do, uh, thanks to Lauren and Kaya, largely. So I'm going to read the list of co-sponsors. Uh, Memorial Church, the Phillips Brooks House, the Criminal Justice Program of Study, the Department of Sociology at Harvard, at Harvard University, the Program in Criminal Justice Policy and Management, the Wiener Center at the Kennedy School, uh, Platt here at the Law School, Prisoner Legal Assistance Program, the Office of Minister Study, Ministry Studies at Harvard Divinity School, Student and Fellows Programs and Special Projects at the Kennedy School, uh, the Harvard Law School Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Review, and Amnesty International Local 133. Uh, so I'm not going to say a lot more about the content. Uh, Richard and the photographs will speak to you up on that. Uh, but I am going to turn it over now to my friend and colleague, Kai Stern, uh, who will uh, give us a little bit more context. Kai? <laughs> gratitudes and share some thoughts on our current punishment crisis, as well as introduce our next speaker, please join me in a brief moment of silence. And for those of you who just came in, welcome. Take some time to get settled. I'm glad you're here. Um, if you are willing, close your eyes and imagine an 11 year old who is isolated in a six by eight foot set. Imagine his tears. Imagine her trembling. Imagine the unspeakable suffering endured by children locked behind bars across our nation. Let us consider with care our society's soul and be still and quiet together. Thank you. Thank you, David Harris, Ernest Owens, and Kelly Garvin for your steadfast support. Thank you, Dave Western, Christine Cole, Jonathan Walton, and the Phillips Brooks House Association for your generous contributions. And thank you, Lauren Herman, the Divinity School superstar Esquire was worked tirelessly to make this event a success. And thank you, Richard Ross, for trusting that I would follow through on that conversation in Santa Barbara and do everything 
I could to share your inspired and soul-stirring work. And thank you all for your presence today. A few years ago, while I was working at the Houston Institute, I was researching an innovative program in a California youth prison. The prison is called a camp. I resist the euphemism. Inside this prison, there was an effort to be green, to teach the children who were incarcerated there to reduce waste, to reuse and recycle. During my tour, I noticed different colored bins for paper, metal, compost, and glass. Beyond the bins and down the hall, children were locked in windowless cells behind metal doors with openings to fit a food tray. I could see pairs of eyes peeking out of the small rectangular space, watching as the officer explained the value of being environmentally friendly. So much care was taken with the garbage. Not so with the children. A note on language. People in prison do not like to be called inmates. Prison officers do not like to be called guards. Nobody I know trying to find his or her way home from jail or prison calls him or herself a re-enterer. A child who is shackled is called a juvenile detainee. A room with feces smeared across the walls and nothing but a grate in the floor for people who are locked inside naked to relieve themselves is called a safety cell or a quiet space. Electric shock punishment is described by the US Department of Justice as a total learning environment. Euphemisms are part of the trap, part of the web that distorts reality and obscures the fact that we are talking about people with human rights who are being violated in the name of justice. There is no more pressing human rights issue, no more urgent spiritual crossroads or threat to democracy than our current punishment crisis. What do I mean? The US has more people in prison and a higher incarceration rate than any other nation. More than Russia, South Africa, Mexico, Iran, India, Australia, Brazil, and Canada combined. For most of the 20th century, imprisonment in the United States was rare. One in 1,000 people was behind bars on any given day. Now, one in 31, more than seven million people is in jail, in prison, on probation or parole. And that one in 31 does not include all of the people in immigration prisons, prisons operated by private companies, or our military outside of the US, nor does it account for, at last count, <coughs> 66,332 children, some as young as seven years old, who are locked in prison at this very moment. In the introduction to her groundbreaking book, Burning Down the House, the End of Juvenile Prison, Richard Ross's photograph is on the front, Nell Bernstein, this is uh, to be published in June, Nell Bernstein outlines the current landscape of what Richard Ross calls juvenile injustice. Young people in prison represent one of the most glaring examples of racial injustice in the United States. Black and brown youth, especially those from communities of concentrated disadvantage, face far different consequences and overwhelmingly represent the children who are locked behind bars. They are more likely to have been victims of violence than to have perpetuated it. Of course, incarceration only exacerbates existing vulnerabilities and exposes children to post-traumatic stress syndrome, social, social isolation, stigma, and more violence. Approximately 90% of American teenagers have committed an illegal act that could qualify them for time behind bars. And one third of all teens have committed a serious crime, but most never meet a police officer, let alone experience being locked inside of a cell. In general, the kids who do get that pass simply grow out of crime. By adulthood, the illegal transgressions are gone or not detected. 
Despite the fact that juvenile crime is steadily declining, police arrest nearly two million children each year. We even arrest preschoolers. And it is not uncommon in our country for children as young as five years old to be handcuffed around their upper arms because their wrists are too small for the steel intended for adult bodies. Demographers predict that one in three American school children will be arrested by the age of 23. On average, we spend $88,000 per year to incarcerate a young person in a state prison, more than eight times the 10,652 we invest in his education. In many states, this gap is even wider in California. For example, the cost of a year in a youth prison reached a high of $225,000, while education spending dipped to less than $8,000. Nearly 40% of all children behind bars are there, to, are there due to low-level, low-threat offenses, technical violations of probation, drug possession, minor property offenses, like stealing a bagel, as is evident in the captions of Ross's photograph, public order offenses or status offenses, activities that would not be crimes for adults like possession of alcohol or truancy. At the most basic level, US punishment models fail to meet the basic standards set by the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. We continue, for example, to be the only industrialized nation that refuses to sign the UN Declaration of the Rights of the Child and continue to try individuals who committed crimes as children as if they were adults. Although many interpreted the 2012 Supreme Court rulings in Miller versus Alabama and Jackson versus Hobbs as holding that life without the possibility of parole, LGOT is the acronym, that those sentences for juveniles are unconstitutional. In reality, the court made a much more narrow ruling. The court ruled that state laws imposing mandatory LWAP are unconstitutional because they violate the Eighth Amendment's ban on cruel and unusual punishment. It did not rule that LWAP is unconstitutional when applied to someone who commits a crime prior to age 18. As legal professor Richard Dow suggests, you have to have awfully low standards to think this decision marks much by way of progress when it comes to criminal punishment. So how do we intervene? How do we interrupt existing practice? How do we resist injustice? First, we have to face the suffering. We have to tell truths about how we punish. And we have to build relationships with people who are most intimate with the current crisis. Let us now turn our attention to an inspiring student who is, to quote Martin Luther King, a drum major for justice. Natalie Smith is a junior at Harvard College where she studies sociology and visual art, focusing on creative responses to social inequality. Natalie worked as a research assistant on Michelle Lamont's Comparative Responses to Racism project and is currently collaborating with Bruce Western to produce a documentary that features the personal narratives of formerly incarcerated men and women in Boston. Natalie also works at the Boston-based Arts and Education Urbano project where public high school students team up with professional teaching artists to make social justice themed art interventions. During her freshman year, Natalie began volunteering with the Phillips Brooks House Association, also known as PBHA. And for those of you who are not familiar, PBHA was founded in 1904 and is a student-run, community-based, nonprofit public service organization based here at Harvard University, comprised of more than 85 programs with over 1,400 volunteers, PBHA programs, strive to meet community needs while advocating for structural change. PBHA is the umbrella organization for four education programs in prison. Suffolk Prison Education, Women's Empowerment and Prison Education, Men's Empowerment and Prison Education, and Youth Prison Tutoring. Youth Prison's tutoring mission is to connect young people who study at Harvard to young people who have been committed to juvenile detention facilities in Boston. 
by opening channels of contact between young people in disparate socio-structural positions, youth prison tutoring endeavors to offer a mutually enriching experience to the participants. Natalie Smith has been serving as the program director for the youth prison tutoring for the past two years. Please join me in offering a warm welcome to Natalie Smith. Thank you for the kind introduction, Kelly. When we were 11, he would repeatedly prank call my family's landline in the middle of the night. I'd hear his muffled voice through the receiver, stifling giggles in my father's enraged responses. When we were 13, he got suspended from school for shanking the girl who sat behind him. I went to tell the principal indignantly that she'd been poking him with pencils too and was dismissed with a consolation can of Pepsi in my hand. When we were 15, he got caught smoking pot. He got caught shoplifting from the gas station by our high school. He got caught. The last conversation I can remember having with him was on instant messenger. His words, I can't believe I'm going to juvie over a bottle of Yoohoo wavered in blue font across my computer monitor. Shortly before he was to be committed, Colin was hit by a car while riding his bike at night. Most of the school went to his funeral. It's probably for the better he died anyways, my best friend tried to console me. You know he didn't want to go down that path he was about to start on. Why would an American teenager remark on the death of her friend this way. As a freshman in high school, I believed that lives full of endless possibilities lay ahead of each of us. I couldn't understand my best friend's suggestion that whether Colin had died or lived was beside the point because, branded as a delinquent, his life was already over. The next year, I not only began to see her point, I got a taste of the criminal justice system myself. A white friend, a Native American friend, and I had skipped out on fifth period to smoke pot in the car my white friend's mom had let her borrow. Now, I wish I didn't feel the need to define my friends by their races here, but as you'll see, this information is central to the story that follows. While the face of racism may be different in rural Montana than in America's urban centers, it's still dawn to mask another's humanity. My white friend had just hit the pipe when the officer approached the car. Though she was in the driver's seat, she was told to keep herself in the car while the two brown girls were told to step outside to be frisked for illicit substances. After compensating our pipe and packs of cigarettes, the officer returned to the driver's window to ask my white friend for her license, vehicle registration, and insurance. When she failed to produce a single document, the officer sighed and gave her a stern warning to remember them next time. He then returned his attention to my native friend and me and told us he was going to cut us a break. He said that because we had voluntarily given him our drunk paraphernalia, he would just give us tickets for cigarettes. And this is how I got a criminal record at the age of 15. For the past seven years, I've struggled to make sense of this event. At first, I remember feeling outraged by the overt racism I had experienced. But in the following years of high school, this self-righteous anger, anger became tinged with fear as I realized that my minor in possession, or MIP charge, prevented me from applying to academic programs I was otherwise qualified for. My senior year, I was terrified that because of my criminal record, I would, I would be unable to receive scholarships or even admissions to the colleges I wanted to attend. Though still disturbing, my best friend's contention that Colin was better off dead than in juvie no longer seemed as reprehensible. Through the support of my parents and the help of an exceptionally dedicated high school counselor, I was able to expunge my record. Now, I began to wonder if I was lucky to only get an MIP for tobacco. I mean, the police officer could have written me up for juvenile drug possession of marijuana and smoking paraphernalia. Maybe I should have just been grateful to him for giving me a significantly more minor charge. Looking back now, 
I've come to understand this experience as escape from the two-sided sword of arbitrary justice. On one side, my brown skin friend and I were punished while our white skin friend was not. On the, but on the other side, the tickets we were giving, given were much less damning than what the law says we should have received. I still wonder how the same scenario would have played out if I had been a different race or gender or social class. Though I once believed that every human was equal before the law, I now see that it's not so much differences in what we do, but differences in who we are and what we are associated with that determines our fate in the legal system and beyond. So, who has been deemed worthy of investing $88,000 per year in to warehouse in a youth prison? And who has been deemed worthy of investing $60,000 per year in to send to Harvard College? A countless number of variables, including demographic characteristics, family background, and access to educational resources and opportunities, contribute to defining juvenile delinquents and future college students as two distinct social groups. But seven years ago, I was both. Now a junior at Harvard College, I think about the young people I go to school with and the young people I work with through PBHA's Youth in Prison Tutoring Program. Although so, some combination of circumstance and action has resulted in our differential positions, I believe it is our underlying sameness that allows us to learn from each other's differences. By opening channels of contact between young people in disparate positions, I believe that we will begin to question the constructs that divide us, and in doing so, motivate each other to fight for a future in which equal treatment is a reality for everyone, in which death is no longer the preferable option, and in which young people do not believe their futures have been predetermined by their past. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. One more round of applause. Further ado, let's turn our attention to Richard Ross, a most accomplished photographer who will share a little bit about his story and the topic of juvenile injustice. Please join me. Thanks, Ray. Um, I'm going to go through a lot of information really quickly. Can you hear me fine on this? Uh, this is the way I work through a lot of it's social media, so I'm gonna make a totally blatant pitch uh, for signing up on Facebook and liking me. Uh, but I do have to start this by thanking Kia and David and the people at Harvard. It's like, I'm completely humbled by the introduction of the information that I've gotten before. It's just, the words are heartbreaking and these kids are just so commanding. Um, and you really put it in perspective, it's really, it's, it's a phenomenal world that we work in. It's impossible to work in, yet it gives some meaning. Um, this is to introduce what I do. I go into these cells, and this is a little bit of an anomaly. Normally, I take off my shoes when I go in these cells. So I visited about 32 states, interviewed over 1,000 kids, and worked for uh, five years without telling about anybody about it, uh, being pretty much in secret. And then the last three years, it's been an open source of uh, information. Um, but the strategy I use is I knock on the door of the kid's cell. I ask if I can come in, and I take off my shoes before I go into their cell, their room, whatever the euphemism is that they call it. And I try to give the kid a certain amount of uh, dignity uh, and give them control over an older white guy which is something that they don't have. I sit on the floor specifically so that they have the authority above me. But I'm not a judge, I'm not an attorney, I'm not a probations officer, I'm an artist and a human being and I have a certain credential in doing that. And I can speak for these kids and that's what I do. The kids that have the least voice from families that have the least authority, from communities that have the least power, I try to give them a voice. Real quick background, I came from a background of doing editorial photography. I teach at UC Santa Barbara. 
I was a total photographic whore. Anybody would call me up and I would do anything for money and go anywhere and I would pay attention to the culture that I was learning about. Uh, and it would take me all over the place. And each of these things represent vast periods of time. Uh, more recently, I was asked by some people to work on places like going to Guantanamo, which I did. And I was able to negotiate my way into these places in spite of the fact that I'm not an attorney, in spite of the fact that I made a U-turn on my way to Georgetown Law School, much to the shame of my family. I chose a different path and I do wish my parents would be alive today to see me actually being listened to at Harvard. Uh, I did a project with my daughter where every day for 722 days, I photographed her before she went to high school. She asked me to do it and became a collaboration. And I learned a lot about an adolescent mind that two or three minutes before zero period, and she kept a diary of everything that was going on. But I was engaged with my children on a really intimate level. Um, I did a book called Architecture of Authority I'm remembering to plug in my audio here. Great. Uh, architecture of authority where I realized that by me being allowed to be on this podium, you've ceded me the authority and you're listening to me. I've got 35 minutes maybe, and I'm rolling through it, but it's an exchange of power where you've given it to me. I looked at my kids' Montessori school the circle where everybody is supposedly equal. And that was a certain um, way power was distributed. The Swedish law courts in Gothenburg, designed by Absland, have the uh, tribunal, the prosecution, and the defense all in a circle on the same level. It's not from above. It's not from the bench. The United Nations is formed like that, where everybody is equal, except for some nations being more equal than others in this irregular horseshoe. And then I did work like I photographed at uh, Abu Ghraib. I looked at places of real injustice in an adult system where people that acted out in the midst of a larger population at Abu Ghraib in Iraq, negotiating to get to Iraq gave me skills that get me into juvenile detention negotiating with my wife to tell her that I'm not crazy by going to Iraq in the midst of it to do this work. It all works together to get me where I am now. But then I looked at something by Booker T. Washington, the study of art that does not result in the making of the strong less willing to oppress the weak means little. I work at the University of California in an art department. My colleagues talk about line, shape, form, composition, and texture, and I try to respect them, I really do. But I feel that the work that I'm doing has such a calling to me that it's difficult to stay in the same room with them without rolling my eyes too much. And then I decided that I was going to use art as a weapon. And my wife, who is an academic writer, said, use the word tool. I said, we've got the war on terror, the war on poverty, the war on drugs. You don't go to war with a tool. My art is going to be my weapon, and it has to be that lethal. So how do you make it lethal? You take images like this. The left is the juvenile detention center in El Paso, Texas. The right is Guantanamo Delta Camp, a cell for the worst of the worst. What's the difference between the two? Terrorists have a window. Kids don't. But it's the same material, this cinder block and this concrete, which is cold, noisy, impersonal, harsh. The sound and the cold reflects off the wall. It's so isolating to be in there. As soon as you cross the threshold of one of these cells, it's, it hurts so much. But there's so many issues involved that it's really hard to address all of them. And I, I've got such a brief period of time. But there's health, sleep, education, gangs, nutrition, safety, gang enhancement, sexual exploitation, visitation. I can't do it all. So what I'll try and do is let a couple of these kids speak for me, but realize there are multiple issues and each one can be a master's thesis, a doctoral dissertation, and more. So this is a kid from Kansas City. Uh, I got shot. It was on the 22nd of April. Well, they shattered my, my, my thumb, because it went in my thumb and came out of my pinky. And, uh, hopefully, they took a piece of bone out of my hip. They put it in my thumb, like, just like yesterday. Two days ago, it's all great. 
things are going great. I'm still alive, so I'm good. I asked the kid, is there, is there a sense of irony in what you're saying? He didn't know what irony was, and I tried to explain that to him. But this addresses the pervasiveness of violence, the kid being held in isolation, and the fact that his right hand is shattered and he thinks it's all going great. Because for him, it is going great. This is sort of like the standard that he holds himself to. Uh, the, I can't talk about the availability of guns. I asked him how much a piece cost. And he says, well, 50 bucks if it's a small caliber like a 22." I said, is, is that with a full clip? He says, well, if you, don't, if you didn't pay for the clip, you got played. So I can't bring up gun pervasiveness in our culture in certain audiences. I was addressing an audience of judges in Georgia about two weeks ago. I have to really hone my decision as to what I say in an audience is, that's going to be receptive to what I'm doing. But each one is fine-tuned, so I'm trying to make it really specific here. Uh, this is a kid in uh, Oregon uh, who is the result of Graham versus Florida, was given a, his life sentence without parole was changed. Florida doesn't have the look back, so it's not retroactive. So each time you have to go and make further litigation and make a stronger case to try and have it pushed back. The governor of Iowa uh, commuted all the sentences of kids that were given life imprisonment without parole, and he commuted them to 60, uh, changed them to 60 years rather than life sentences. Effectively, you're not doing anything. So what am I trying to do? I'm trying to give the visual tools to advocates. I've got this great marketing system. The business school would be crazy with this one. I do the work free, I photograph all over the place, and I give the images away to nonprofits. It's a perfect system for going broke quickly. Uh, but it's really rewarding, and from my portion of life, it's really exactly what I want to do. Two grown kids, everything's paid for, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I want to change the current practice. I'm really ambitious like that. And I think that it really is changing significantly, but it needs that much more of a push. And I want to frame the issue for you. I want the next generation to understand what's at stake. And I do that by giving images to people and trying to make those singular images and making sure that they understand that the bigger picture is these places are dangerous, ineffective, unnecessary, wasteful, obsolete, and inadequate. That's what they are. And every image that I show you represents several of these cases brought together, each one being brought to a, a prominence or a subordination. Uh, this is Orleans Parish Prison in Louisiana. Rarely, I'm from New York, but rarely would I use the, the word piece of work casually. This is Sheriff Guzman, he's a piece of work. Uh, he rents out space in Orleans Parish Prison to other parishes and brings in young men. These are 22 young men, undersupervised. There was a fight the night before, so there's no TV, no books, no dominoes, which is important in this community, no cards, and it's August, New Orleans, no air conditioning but he's making a profit for every young black man in this cell. It's, what, is this 1700, 1800? This is 2013 when this was shot. How does this exist? How do we do it? Uh, this is a kid in Kansas that the judge put him into a cell and said, you're not doing your homework and your parents say you're out of control. You're gonna stay here for two weeks. We're teaching you a lesson. And I didn't understand uh, the political science when I was studying as an undergraduate, but now I understand states' rights in a much different aspect, and it's county rights. The federal legislation really doesn't impact this that much. It's all really manicured down to the local community. He's in a cell and he's next to four kids that are being held for armed bank robbery that are 17. This is a kid that's 12. Uh, Washoe County, Nevada. This is a fifth grader. And here's, here's another phrase coming out of my mouth that I don't want coming out of my mouth. In my day, you got in a fight with another kid. The teacher would say, you, there, you, there. That was it. This kid got in a fight with another kid, but cops are in school now. Uh, there's a predominance of it. There's certain protocols. Kid gets in a fight with another kid. The school police are called. The school police have their protocol. He goes to the detention center. It's 1030 in the morning, Washoe County, Nevada. The, principal uh, makes, says goodbye to the kid. The detention center director welcomes the kid at 10.30, cannot get a hold of the mother, can't leave her job. She's uh, 
doesn't have papers. She leaves her job. She's going to lose her job. And the siblings are all going to be at risk. So the kid stays there until 6.30. So he's in fifth grade. These are not gangbangers. And I really had to sit there and tell the kid, don't worry, your mommy's going to come for you soon. Come for you soon. Meanwhile, they take his shoes, they take his belt, he's on suicide watch. This is a fifth grader. How do we get here? What is this about? So a uh, professor at Princeton University named John DiUlio uh, in the mid-80s came up with the idea that these are super predators. And it really sold a lot of newspapers. This is the most law-abiding generation in the history of data collection. Well, they're not going to do a Fox News special on that one. And you're not going to buy a newspaper on the basis of the, these are great kids. Just sort of like introduce yourself to them. Sit down and have a cup of coffee. Have a can of Pepsi with them. They're, they're doing nothing wrong. Yeah, they're smoking a little weed. Yeah, they're staying out past curfew. Who gives a shit? But if you treat them as human beings instead of criminalizing normal adolescent misbehavior, uh, you accomplish something. And so the language has to change. You can't refer to these kids as super predators. Just using the word predator, uh, juvenile, juvenile detention, juvenile behavior, your upper lip starts sneering. You're so juvenile. Uh, if you use the word youth, child, or kid, your response to it goes up really quickly in terms of positive. Any focus group will tell you that. You look at the world of girls, which I've been focusing on a lot these days. Uh, it used to be called uh, teenage prostitutes. Well, in the last 18 months, I would say, the language generally has changed dramatically to victims of sex child victims of sex trafficking. And it really aids the way we address these kids. And they're all young, they're all, I mean, every story is the same with these girls. They've all been abused, all of them. There's no exceptions. You know, it might be one or two, but They've all been raped, sexually abused at an early age. Uh, and they're all involved in drugs early on. Um, it's a lives of privation, lives of difficulty. And nobody listens to them. Nobody's paying attention to them. Uh, this is Houston. Uh, sometimes I have to get court orders to get into these places. The director of uh, Harris County, Texas, said, I want you to come in and give us photographs so that we can make a better case for better outcomes for these kids. I'll take you around, give us three days. You could photograph the good, the bad, and the ugly. Doesn't matter. And this was a whole wing of 11-year-old kids. Uh, this is LA Los Padrinos, and this was done last Sunday. All the girls down these hallways in very paramilitary fashion that they're forced to conform to the institutions, and they become institutionalized. They respond to the way the authority is given on very formal terms. Uh, it's a brutal winter. I was invited here. I thought it would be spring. This is Hawaii, Hawaii's paradise. Well, this is Oahu when they were under federal order because it was such a shithole. Uh, rat infested, bad food, bad, unsafe conditions. And their court administrator invited me there and said, we've had to build a new institution the new institution cost them $160 million. Houses 55 kids that are pre-adjudicated. They haven't been convicted of anything. 55 kids, $160 million. And the court administrator said, this is what we built. It's based more or less on Pelican Bay. We're locked into the architecture of this for the next 50 years. What do we do? I don't have the answers. I can document it for them, but I can give them uh, the information that shows them how much it has to change. Uh, this is a kid, Ronald Franklin. His face is showing because he's an adult now and he's given me permission. Uh, when he was 13, his mother tried to kill him, quite literally. Stabbed him repeatedly and the police were called. He ran away from home at 13. Joined up with a bad group of kids in Florida. Uh, they committed a heinous crime, not capital, but it was pretty bad. He was 13. He's been held in Miami, Dade, for four and a half years without a trial. Some of you are law students. I know there's something called the Sixth Amendment. I know it. But the kids have the least rights and the least comprehension about the rights. And they, uh, if they're in the detention system or the criminal system rather than dependency, there's no uh, advocate for them in the room. The public defender is there. But often they have too many excuses and they're overloaded. Budget cutbacks have uh, 
reduced the judicial budgets, have longer times to hearings. It's a nightmare that keeps on rolling on. Uh, Kia had alluded to, I think, um, the California system. This is Alameda. Uh, in Alameda, it's $249,000 for a kid in the juvenile detention system. That's almost a quarter of a million dollars. Oakland, right next door, out of the detention center, the state, pay, the county pays $4,900 per kid in the classroom. $4,900, quarter of a million dollars. You could take the kid and put him in a Lexus and drive him to Harvard and send him here for four years, and he'll do better. But we're, uh, it's a deterrent, it's retribution, uh, and uh, it's rehabilitation. We're not great on rehabilitating. It's not good on deterring, but it's really good at retribution. We do get our pound of flesh from the kids because institutions will bully the kids. They don't have the voice to really fight back and let you know what's going on. Uh, so this is one kid that's held in isolation because he's turned 18, he's given his own wing. He's still being held for trial and it's too close. So he has 24 seven guards on him and he has a social worker and a teacher, although he hasn't been in school in the last three years anyway. The cost is just ridiculous. I'm relatively progressive, somewhat liberal. I would agree with anybody in the Tea Party that this is not the best use of our resources. I'm sure of it. Uh, these are both, uh, a lot of kids are level three, eyes on, 24 hour observation. The kid on the left is under 24 hour observation for the last 19 months. What does this do to a teenager? Uh, I have two kids that are now adults, they were teenagers, they used to try and get away from me. They wanted to hide as much as possible. What's it like? And the waste of resources. Each of these images represent a deep library of current practice around the country. I can't show you the numbers, but they exist. Colorado, they just closed a boot camp there. We look at these kids through the lens of trauma, of food deprivation, sleep deprivation, violence. It doesn't really work to hire people that were drill instructors at Marine bases to shout at them. But that's what we've been doing. Uh, Maryville, I asked the director, what percentage of girls have been sexually abused? He said, what percentage? Every one of them. And most of the boys in the system. That opens me up to a lot of thinking in a different way, how much these kids are victims. And again, it's one of these things of, I'll give you current images and I'll give you a current voice. This is Georgia in a group home about maybe 21 days ago. The first time I was sexually abused was at the age of probably around five. They were with my mother and I tried to tell her a few times and she said I, I didn't know what I was talking about, I was too little. And when I finally gave, the time when I actually finally gave up on trying to get to talk to her about it was when uh, one of her boyfriends, after having raped me, left the room and slammed the door so hard that it didn't actually close, it kind of like swung back open. And I saw her sitting on the couch across from the doorway. And she looked at me and smiled and I knew the whole time that she could hear me screaming. These are these kids, these are the kids' voices. These are, and I just sit there, sometimes I transcribe them, sometimes I tape them. But they're the results of nurturers that don't nurture, parents that should be trusted that they can't trust that are caregivers that don't care. Uh, and these are the result. When you have a kid that has fuck love tattooed on her hands, it's not an act of aggression. It's an act of saying, the people that were supposed to take care of me didn't. Therefore, love is irrelevant to me. And this is a common tattoo amongst the girls. Fuck love. Uh, and the boys. Abusive relationships, these kids are the result of it. Um, this is just a general picture that I've gone around the country and tried to document who they are. 
um, LA, uh, Iowa, uh, with young mothers with ankle bracelets with their infants. Um, and then I started working with the Annie Casey Foundation, who is great at collecting data. So these are their charts. This is uh, what they describe in terms of data. I've been a university professor for 35 years. I have no idea what any of this shit means. <laughs> so I decided they had no images. And I went to them and I said, I will give you all the images. I will create seminal images that tell you that there are lives in the balance and lives at risk and lives at stake so that your data will make some sense to people. And any advocacy that you do will have more power. And it was like, what's the catch? Uh, but it's really become a bit of a passion. I look at this in terms of looking at simple data and charts that uh, Kaya alluded to. This is all the Western world. This is the United States. You have to really keep it simple for people to understand that it's a problem, it's solvable, and it's an anomaly the way we are in this world today. Um, these are all the countries where children are sentenced to die in prison. That's it. There are 256 countries in the world. This is it, the United States. Uh, nothing to be really proud of. And then I'll show images like this so people understand the youth and how young these kids are and the environment that they're in. Uh, and then I'll give little fortune cookie stats and put it on a website and a blog that goes out regularly to try and engage people and spread the understanding that here's an issue you need to address. Children as young as seven can be prosecuted and tried in adult courts in 22 states in the District of Columbia. And they are. And these are the kids. This is a normal bed. And I've been photographing almost every weekend for the last uh, whenever I'm in California, I'll go down to LA and it's a regular pilgrimage. Unit J, which is the youngest of kids in the largest system in the country, and it's 16 cells. And the, some of the kids stay the same, but it's just getting really familiar with them and having them familiar with you. Uh, this is a girl who's uh, doing, uh, did a homicide, she's doing 35 years. The mother was a meth addict. She gave the kid meth when she was seven. The kid became addicted. The kid did a homicide. The mother has since found a certain spirituality and cleaned up her act and is living free. The kid's not. But the parent's not accountable. Uh, you take a look at this phrase that I'm sure you're familiar with in the criminal justice world. If you see a kid in a closet, you're going to go in and you're going to take the kid out of the closet. Not only is it the law to, where the state acts as the parent, it's humanity. But what we do within these institutions, we put them in isolation rooms, timeout rooms, administrative segregation. And then we say, well, they're only in here for, we don't keep them in here more than 16 hours. And I'll talk to kids that will self-report. No, that's not true. I've been here three days. No, I've been here three weeks. No, I've been here three months. So, oh, we take them out one hour every 24 hours for large muscle movement. Who made this determination? Who said that this was sane? Where did this one come up? Well, what happens if you take them out for two hours? Does the world explode? What happened, and these are social kids. These are kids that are part of a larger population. They're teenagers. When you put them in rooms like this, this room was 59 degrees. I travel with a thermometer, I travel with a tape measure, and I travel with a recorder. And I listen to these kids. When you have a teenager, this is not Hannibal Lecter we're talking about. This is not Silence of the Lambs. When you put a kid in this room, you lock the door and you put four deadbolts. These are teenagers. What goes on in their mind? How much can you destroy them? It's really a case of you're almost taking a car and you're running over them and you're going backwards back and forth a few times. And when they don't respond in isolation, when they get upset and frustrated, they restrain them in equipment like this. Current practice. This isn't historical museum. Current practice. California, Oregon, and Washington are really liberal, right? This is Oregon. They're really backwards in terms of dealing with juveniles. And then there are nuances within that. California is pretty 
uh, reactionary in terms of dealing with juvenile justice. Santa Cruz is enlightened, but I can't go into the nuance, and I'm not an attorney. So I'm just giving you my best shot as hard as I can really quickly. It's difficult for these kids. The idea of putting a kid into a piece of torture like this to me is reprehensible. It's more horrible if the kid is gay. And then if the kid is transgender, it escalates into a world of pain that is so bizarre. Because uh, this, the director of this institution said, it's against federal law to hold her in isolation. If I put her in with a girl's population, she gets hurt. If I put her in with a boy's population, she's gonna get killed. What do I do? I know it's against the law. I don't want this kid dying on my watch. All these things are bad, gay, transgender, Native American, even worse. Because it's frequently a kid that can be tried on reservation on tribal law in state, depending on what the crime is, who's the perpetrator, who's the victim. Uh, and you get double indemnity on a regular basis. The kid can be tried multiple times. So I go around the country and I try to stay sane and I talk to 14 year olds in Oklahoma and uh, I write their stories and I publish their stories. Uh, this is a kid in um, Nevada. He defecated on his tray, he said the food tastes like shit Therefore, I'll just defecate on my tray. They're not getting the right mental health services in these institutions, and they're not getting the right mental health services within their community. Uh, this is Wisconsin. I spoke to this kid who was 14 years old for about an hour and a half. They wouldn't take off his shackles. Institutions are hoarders of bad behavior. They bully. So the kid wasn't gonna run across the table and leap at me and tear my throat out. He was 14 years old. There was a guard in the room as well, but uh, we can't take off his shackles. And then uh, when you alluded to the fact that there's racism within these institutions, uh, this is Oak Creek, Oregon. I can lay down, that is set up. I can lay down at 7.30. They're waking up at 6 o'clock. Yeah. It's the hastiest time of the She's in isolation for three days because she was intimidating the other girls. Oak Creek, Oregon, which is the major institution in Oregon for girls, there are 49 girls there in the general population. Unbelievably, they're all white. Unbelievably, the one girl that was intimidating the other girl was African-American. I feel like Lewis Black where I wanted to go, do you not understand what you're doing here? Do you not understand what racism is? Are you not talking to this girl and understanding what's going on here? Of course, she's being intimidated by the rest of the population or feels isolated. You've got one black girl in this institution and 49 white ones. And she's be, the black girl's being held in isolation for three days and you won't let her lie down during the day. Whose idea is this? Latino youth are four times more likely to receive an adult sentence for the same crime as white children. African-American youth, nine times more likely to receive the same, sent an adult sentence for the same crime as a white kid. That's who we are today. And these are the kids. And we spend $88,000 per year. And then you have other stats that the cost of feeding a kid in Florida for the day is $1.54. Not per meal, per day. How much did that latte cost you at Starbucks? $1.54 to feed the kid. What are, you, what are we accomplishing? Constant dehumanization of pat-downs, although it really makes no sense. Uh, the way they talk to kids, of talking down to them. And I've, these, I've given these slides to corrections officers, institutions to use as PowerPoints. And when some of them in the Midwest saw this, they walked out and said, we're not giving up our authority when the director of the institution said, why don't you take off your SWAT uniforms and wear Hawaiian shirts on Friday and I'll buy pepperoni pizza for you with uh, pineapple, buy Hawaiian pizza for you. They couldn't get the guards to give up their authority of intimidating the kids. They couldn't get the guard to be able to say to the kid and just go like this and try to talk to them on a lateral on their level. They wouldn't do it. They want to stand up because that's the practice that they're used to. There are examples of like Judge Jimmy Edwards in St. Louis that created the Blewett School. 
And instead of having a zero tolerance in St. Louis, one judge very specifically eliminated zero tolerance in uh, St. Louis. Santa Barbara, which is a very liberal community, they just eliminated zero tolerance last year. Up until then, it was common practice. Kid does something that is, you know, bringing in a, an aspirin, a miniature uh, handcuff or gun on your keychain, zero tolerance. You have to eject them from school. But there are other things at work. This is Worcester, Massachusetts. Instead of isolation rooms, they didn't have the money to build a new facility and a new isolation room. They went to CVS and they bought a plastic chair. They took construction paper and they put settling area. If a kid was acting out, they said, you, over there, sit down, settle down. When you're ready to join the group, come back. It doesn't cost $250 a square foot to build, but it makes sense and it's common practice. But people became, become so much the hoarders of these bad practices, it creates things that are worse and worse. Uh, I did a project in Indiana and I photographed there doing some other work that didn't relate to this. And I photographed the Indiana State Fair. By the accident of the uterus that these girls were issued from, the fact that they were my, white, Midwest, and from Indiana, and female, you know that their outcomes were going to be successful. And then I saw a similar wall in Miami, where before the kids are released from Miami-Dade, they put an ankle bracelet is put on their leg, and the expired doesn't mean their driver's license expired. These, this means these young black men with this in the past two or three years of this photograph were killed by gunshots within their community because they were young and black and born in poverty in Miami-Dade, they have a totally different outcome than these young white girls in Indianapolis, Indiana. This keeps me awake at night to think of the injustice of this. So what do I do? I create a website. Uh, it's pretty active, it's pretty robust. You can go on it and take any images you want to advocate for these kids. You can put in uh, to a pretty good search engine, girl, Massachusetts, uh, sex trafficking, and you can get an entire library, and you could use it for any report that you're doing. You could do it for anything that you want to do in terms of uh, changing social policy. Uh, I give it away. Um, Harper's approached me about three years ago and said, um, you've got enough. You don't need to be the Airstream tra trailer with stickers from every state. You have done a longitudinal study and these kids demand your attention now. Once it got out, it became an issue that became important and people, it was sort of the timing of it as well as me being in the right place at the, with the right material at the right time, I think. I may have been moving in that direction and maybe I moved it this much, you know, the one millimeter. But people started addressing that issue. Uh, about two weeks ago, uh, Senator Richard Durbin and Al Franken, they had a, a judicial, the Justice Committee was meeting in the Senate to address use of isolation cells for kids and changing that practice. So uh, my images were around the room to uh, make it real for the questioning. I had done a dozen books, nobody would publish it. Everybody said books on social justice don't make money. The new press wouldn't publish it. They used my images. They say, can we use it for covers? But they wouldn't publish the book. So having sort of like growing up in New York and having a certain amount of moxie or chutzpah, I just said, that's OK, I can do it. Uh, published it myself and distributed. The first printing sold out within three months. And we're into the third printing and still going. And it goes to the right people. We've sent it to the Congressional Black Caucus, to the Supreme Court, to high schools, to middle schools. Uh, it won American Library Awards, so it gets to the kids that they see who it is. It goes to detention centers, and it gets tagged and used, and kids see that people pay attention to them. I end up speaking at uh, conferences of juvenile journalists around the country. I've created an app that you can pull off my website so that you can have uh, Kaya Stern, uh, she could put in her telephone number, uh, all her information, but then it'll have a sentence about a group of 
18 different kids where every time you write a letter to somebody within the system, you remember that there's a life at stake. I used to do these exhibitions that were really matted, framed, very precious, would go all over the country to Europe. And then I said, I want to communicate this on a less of a commodity basis, but have it in places like Harvard and places like a Baptist church and hallways. It doesn't matter. I want people talking about it. So the work now is in a crate that I can pick up, costs 25 bucks to ship, and I don't care about it. It doesn't, it's not insured. Just get it out there and have people talking about it and have it act as a nexus of communication between sociology, education, uh, law. Art is somewhere down on the totem pole as well. Uh, in Philadelphia, it was shown at uh, the Crane Art Center, uh, right next to Kensington. They had lawyers come in and help kids expunge their records. And money was raised to help these kids do it. Uh, I was interested in what isolation was. So I checked into an institution in the Midwest. I was mugged, I was uh, fingerprinted, and I stayed, just according to their practice, in a cell for 24 hours. I set up a camera in the corner and had an intervalometer, so every seven seconds it photographed me. And it was a horrendous experience, too. And I knew I could get out whenever I want, and I'm an adult. A kid's taken from the classroom or taken from their family and put in here, and time is really infinite in front of them, and it's scary for them, horribly scary. So how do we do this? How do we change this? Right now, we have it framed so that the child is accountable to society and its institutions, but the institutions are broken. They really are. So if you reframe it, and you have the institutions accountable to the kid, if a kid fails a drug test, it's called dropping dirty or a bad UA, why not give them drug counseling? Or why not, why not question how bad is it on the big scheme of things if they're a teenager and it's Friday night and they're smoking a little weed? Is this the reason you want to have them as a violating their probation and bring them back into this institution? And now I'm photographing these kids that are, it's called 241 ones in California. So the girl on the bottom is strictly in dependency. So she's in the Child Protective Services system. The kid on top is dual custody between dependency and delinquency, which is a lot of where they overlap. They go from dependency into delinquency, and I'm now photographing them really young, as young as this. You see and you hear how young they are. And, the, and I said, do they come in a separate car? Is there a man and a woman that take you? No, I went in the police car with the policeman. It's horrific. Uh, this was shot about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, not really not long. Uh, this was a kid that's been in uh, LA County. He's 11 years old. Uh, this is his fourth time in Grand Theft Auto. It's about this big. Grand Theft Auto, where do you live? I live in Watts. Do you reach the pedals? Uh, usually. Uh, where do you go? I don't know. I can't read. Um, how far do you go? I go until I run out of gas or they pull me over. Why do you go? I live in Watts. It was almost like talking to Camus, the most existential conversation on the planet. Of course, I understand completely but you're not giving him the services he needs. 88% of these kids are in for nonviolent crimes, crimes of opportunity, not person-on-person -person crimes, wrong place for them. Even the 12% that you might have a little bit of fear about, it's not a good place for getting them to rehabilitate them. It doesn't work. I'm doing three books. These two are gonna be out at the end of the year, Girls in Justice and Juvie Talk, where in Silmar, a kid will say, I'm doing okay, but he's been washed. What does washed mean? Society has washed their hands of us, or he's washed down the drain. How do you have kids' lives that are washed down the drain at this age? But we do. And what I'm trying to do now is, I can't do it myself, but I've been asked to photograph Immigrations and Customs Enforcement, pre-trial bail uh, disparities where people will stay in jail for endless periods of time. Um, ICE, 
uh, Child Protective Services, can't do it all. So my goal now is what I want to pitch to you, is I'm trying to create a portal. I'm going down to New York tomorrow to talk to a foundation where you can be socially active. You can gather images, information, interviews, video, audio, it doesn't matter. And I'm trying to create a portal where nonprofits can go to it, give you a minimal amount, get the information to them free or cheap in order to be better advocates. And if somebody commercially would want to use it, more power to you, get you rewarded for your activism and be able to do more work. And I'm trying to do it under the title, The Image of Justice. That's my goal. I'm too old to do this alone anymore. And I'm too tired. I really should have been asking the kids all along eight years ago, what's your, how many failed placements have you been in? How many group homes have you been in? I can't do it again. I need help. So this is how you help me. This is how I help you. And this is where you go onto my website. This is where you go to Facebook and you friend me. This is where you tweet the shit out of me. And that's it. I'm going to be available upstairs at the talk, and there are books, I think, in the bookstore that are available also. And I'll answer questions if you want. We are hoping uh, <coughs> that we can have some questions. And as Richard said, we're also hoping that you know, the exhibit's up on the third floor. For those of you who haven't seen it, we want to make sure there's time to go up and take a look at it. Uh, <coughs> just have the setting, obviously. You know, we're all you know, very moved by this work. And, uh, challenged by what Richard is saying for us to do. And I hope we can all take him up on that. <coughs> oh, hi, I hope we can all take him up on that and uh, that we will participate both uh, uh, on social, social media but also taking advantage of this image of justice. And, uh, we'll have the video from today up on our website and we'll have links there for how you can do that uh, as Richard gives them to us. So, uh, uh, are there questions? And if there are questions, I'd ask that you go to the mic so that we can record it, please. If there are no questions, we can go see the exhibit. I have a question. Um, so the adults in the system, um, you know, there's a lot of people who are, who've been in prison or jailed for contempt of cop, for, uh, you know, giving uh, someone in authority the wrong attitude. Um, you know, just being framed essentially. You know, what's your, um, what's your take on how many, I mean, it's terrible enough that these kids are in there for these minor crimes that they have committed, but what's your take on how many kids are in there for crimes that never happened? Uh, well, in the, in the eyes of those in authority, uh, it's, it's called POAing, pissing off an adult. Teenagers are great at that. They have unlimited skills. Um, I can walk on the, I'm from California, I can walk on the other side of the street if I want to smoke a joint. If I walk on this side of the street and there's a cop coming, I can ditch it. But if you stand there and you blow smoke in the face of a cop, uh, they're another human being and they're uh, being deprived of their respect, which is a tremendous word in not only this community, but this time. The authority wants a certain amount of respect, uh, and the kid wants a certain amount of respect. And if you violate a social contract in terms of who's doing what, you're in trouble. A kid doesn't know these social skills. Uh, an adult is more tuned to it. Uh, they will avoid it. A kid likes to push the buttons. So I think there's a tremendous number. Am I able to uh, get that in terms of data or statistics? No. But you can bet that there are many kids in there that could have avoided been, being in there if they had not thrown a cigarette butt out the window in front of a cop when they're pulled over and just defied them, pushed the buttons. Uh, it's a large percentage. I don't know what it is. A lot of these are crimes of opportunity. You know, there's an iPod sitting there, an iPhone, and somebody left it, and somebody's back is turned, they take it. That's what exists. Should, they, should their lives be decimated? No. I don't have a hard statistic on it, though. Other questions? Yep. 
I, I really appreciate the work you're doing. Um, I'm a little curious, though. What is your, your follow-up work to a lot of the nonviolent offenders that are being recycled through the system in various parts of the country? I can't follow up directly with the kids. And I, I'm not trained. I'm not the, uh, I don't have the legal uh, chops. I don't have the criminology or the sociology background. I give the images to people that do. And I want, uh, I, I follow up all the time in terms of uh, reading the way the information is contextualized, the way the images are given. Um, it's changing. The population of these kids is going down dramatically and crime hasn't gone up. Normally you would think that there would be some sort of correlation. Uh, intuitively, I would think that it doesn't happen. The two states where uh, the population is going up in terms of juvenile, juveniles being held, uh, Pennsylvania and North Dakota. And there's no decrease in crime in that. And Pennsylvania has the uh, kids for cash scandal in Scranton where two judges were sentenced to long terms for sending kids to private institutions and getting kickbacks. I follow up as much as I can, but my, in some cases, it, I'm diverting a little bit. I used to do beautiful images and I really wanted my work to be timeless. Now I feel I'm trying to do work of this moment. And every time I'm in the cell with a kid, I'm trying to get his story and get him or her to communicate to the outside world. And I give it to other people to act on. Thank you, Richard. I'm Linda, I'm with Citizens for Juvenile Justice. And I actually brought in some materials back there that have, I'm one of those not-for-profits that gets some use of, of your photographs. So we have some information back there. But what I'm wondering is with the work that you've been doing and sharing this along, have you, have you been able to estimate how many people have acted after seeing this and understanding what's going on? You know, are they, are there, or is there movement in different states? Are, they ta are legislators really being moved by this? Do you have any of that kind of information? I work a lot with the JDAI, the Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative, uh, which is part of the Annie E. Casey Foundation. And they have the data and the populations are declining. And more and more people from Biloxi, Mississippi to, um, you know, remote to, the, to Maine are buying into it and saying that it's more cost effective, better outcomes for the kids if we deter them and we create a lot of alternatives to lock down uh, the deep end of the system. Uh, we just get better outcomes for the kids and it's more uh, a better economic outcome for society. It does get better. And I know that uh, somebody called me up and said, so-and-so is, I saw a report, they're using your image and they don't, they haven't credited you. And in terms of my satisfaction, I feel like if there are images out there of these kids, I know who they, I know who they are. And people in your world know who I am and how to contact me. So I, my ego's satisfied and my authorship doesn't have to be copyrighted across everything. I know in terms of the kid in the cell that it has meaning. Okay, I have a comment um, rather than a question. And my comment is that, um, well, I go to Bada. It's an alternative school in Boston. And um, I'm coming from Milton High, which is, it's a, like, you know, it's a difference, a huge difference. And I feel like like before any of this can like move in progress, like you have to work in like the schools and put an effort in like, and you have to invest in the schools. And like, I feel like, yeah. So I feel like be, maybe doing an assignment like on the schools and, you know, showing the difference in like how bad the schools are in a city in Boston versus the suburban schools and, why kids don't want to go to school because they don't get offered as much as they should be getting offered and the you know material in school and it's just our lunch is like jail lunch <laughs> like so it's like yeah so that's all that's my, my comment uh, i agree with you completely my my wife invited me into a bathroom in san francisco and she said you got to see this and i said what and she said and she showed me there were tampons and sanitary napkins out on a wicker table. And she said, the social contract has been lost. And you look at this and you say, 
This is girls saying we're going to take care of girls. How many times have I gone into a Shell station driving along and they say, uh, our bathroom's out of order, or a restaurant says, for customers only? That is a recent event, and it's just a, a, something we've constructed that doesn't exist in the rest of the world. The rest of the world takes care of each other in a different way than we've decided is OK. We should be taking care of the schools. When you talk to a kid in Philadelphia and they say, they've torn down these three schools, but they're building a new juvenile detention center, and the director invites you in to photograph the juvenile detention center, the kid says, that's where my family's going to be going to school, in the detention center. That's not acceptable. So we have to be able to engage and change that. It's not acceptable. Um, I'd like to ask a question about access. Um, you know, who gets it and how? Access to you know, the work that you're doing. Um, it's a battle. Uh, I'm tenacious. I'm arrogant. And I feel like if a battle is worth fighting, it's worth, I choose them really specifically. Uh, Montana, I'm never going to get into. They will never let me into Montana. I know that. The whole detention system there is private, and I know I'm persona non grata. But in some cases, I have to cajole. I have to get court orders. I have to convince a judge. Uh, even then, I was invited by a judge to go to Birmingham, Alabama. And a white Republican judge invited me. Booked a plane ticket. I'm trying to do this on the cheap, non-refundable. Uh, was about to go. The detention center said, no, you can't come in. Uh, he was replaced by another judge, African-American Democrat. He said, there must be some mistake. You're welcome to come in to the Birmingham facility. I thought it was going to be great. And I just double checked. And then this guy, Tommy Rose, said, Mr. Ross, let me make one thing clear. I don't care what this judge said, or that judge said, or what court order you have, this is my institution and you're not going to be in here. Now, I wasn't going to be able to enlist the National Guard over this one, but you just get in where you can, and once I'm in, uh, I'll do everything possible from bringing homemade cookies and footballs and to ingratiate myself with the staff and treat them with respect. I tell the detention center head, look, I know you don't control your front door. They don't. The judicial system will be the ones putting the kids in there. And I'm sympathetic with you, but we can do better with these kids. And we do better by maybe the system coming under criticism, maybe you being slightly threatened by it, but I assure you the kid will get a better outcome because of it. So you have to get everybody to buy in. You can't just do it from the top down and ram it down their throats. It's a battle but I'm willing to fight it. Yep. Last sorry, question, and then I'll meet you upstairs if you want. Inside of me. Um, can you talk a little bit about, I saw an investigative report on MSN some time ago, and it was entitled The Business of Prisons. And they were talking about all, a lot of the major corporations that were doing business with the prison systems, the Nissen Foods and the Little Debbie Snack Cakes and all of those big giant companies that were doing business with prisons. Did, did your research uncover any of that? And if so, does any particular corporation strike you as uh, being heavily involved in that? Um, it works much more insidiously. It's not like Montana has completely privatized their prisons. Uh, but it's much more um, mental health services will be contracted out. Catering will be contracted out. You go to Chicago. Uh, to Cook County, and there's juvenile corrections officers. A lot of them have transferred from an adult system, and they haven't really been trained for juveniles. But then they're supported by Wackenhut guards. So it's much more pervasive on a lower level where it seeps in as the economy changes and people think that it's much more cost effective. Goldman Sachs is doing a program with Rikers where they're issuing bonds to, and I'm not a business major, and my research is what I read without really being able to put it in full perspective, where the bondholders get paid more if there's less recidivism of the juveniles. So I, I'm not quick to condemn it because I'm not quite sure how it's going to work, 
maybe it's going to work great if you get certain elements of private enterprise in there because what we've got now with putting down a quarter of a million dollars for a kid in Alameda County because it's a green facility doesn't work. I know that. But there are more uh, knowledgeable minds than me in terms of the practice. And that's people like the Yanny Casey Foundation and uh, Kaya or David can certainly point you in the right direction. So I'll be upstairs and able to sign books, look at the show with you, or have a cup of coffee or a glass of wine maybe or something with you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please join us on the third floor. And please, Facebook, friend me, do that. <laughs>